Hey everyone, welcome back from spring break. This is our first Bite Size PD. Um, we're coming into those last couple weeks of the school year, so thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to be discussing mathematical discourse in elementary classrooms using the close reading and math routine. So that's kind of a mouthful of a title, but everything in here felt very important, so I didn't want to leave anything out. So I am Ashley Lennox. I am the ISD Elementary Math and Social Studies lead. I also support our informational literacy. Um, I also am one of the people, if you're a fifth grade teacher, you get weekly emails from me. On this screen, that is my email and my cell phone number. If at the end of this, I want your feedback, it's something that I'm super passionate about, and I hope that you will reach out to me for any questions that you have, any feedback that you have. If you tried this, I want you to hear about it and tell me all of the good things that are occurring in your classrooms. So my goal for today is I want to give you some really easy to implement things really in your classroom tomorrow if you wanted to, to support this idea of discourse. So the first one of these, this is a routine called Would You Rather? It's from WouldYouRatherMath.com. So not a hard one to remember, just remember, just Try not to forget the math in there. But really what this is, is it's a list of different questions that you can ask students that have kind of this flair of mathematics discussion about it. So this one is a would you rather have Cheez-Its to cover a rectangle with a length of nine and a perimeter of 22 or a length of five and a perimeter of 20. There's tons of these on there. They're all pretty basic graphics like this. I'm sure that you could also, if you wanted to come up with some really great ones yourself, if you do, please share them with the rest of us. But this is just meant to give students an opportunity to discuss something mathematically. So this one in particular, I chose because this is the time of year where that measurement and data strand starts to come up within the Envision curriculum in your scope and sequence. And it also tends to correlate with that end of year crunch with with rise testing if you're in grades three through five. So this is one of those opportunities that you can put into any time during the school year to let students verbalize how this idea of perimeter works, okay? So today you are here by choice. So take what you need, give what you can. Again, take the things that I have in here. Um, if you have anything that you'd like to give in terms of feedback or anything like that, I would love to have it. So our learning intentions and success criteria are on the screen. Our goal today is to learn about close reading in math and mathematical discourse to increase student talk time and help students develop complex problem solving skills. You'll know you've got it when you have a plan to try the close reading routine in your classroom. When implemented like how we're gonna kind of break down today, the close reading routine is a great place to give some discourse opportunities. So next, I wanted to talk about the five strands of mathematical proficiency. If you were a teacher that did letters over the last couple of years, you are familiar with Scarborough's Rope. Even if you haven't done letters, you've probably heard your colleagues discussing Scarborough's Rope, or it's emerged in some of the literature. Math also has one. This was established in 2001, and it's the five strands of mathematical proficiency. So you can see those up on the screen. What I tried to do for today was I really looked at where I I felt um, the close reading routine in math and mathematical discourse fit into the strands. Procedural fluency, honestly, you could convince me. I think it really hits on all five of these really well, but the four seem very explicit. Procedural fluency, you'd have to really make sure that you are building that in purposefully. Okay. So what does the research say about mathematical discourse? This is something that I've been working hard on over the last couple of years through some um, work that I'm doing at the U. But really what I want you to remember is that the routines in terms of mathematical discourse, they take more time okay, to implement in your classroom, but they're worth it. So doing one to two of the higher order thinking type questions is going to increase student achievement more so than having, you know, 15, 20 problems that are all kind of those low level DOK one questions that are just that recall of information. Now, when we talk about discourse, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't also touch on this idea of UDL or universal design for learning. UDL is something that you're going to see in a lot of the work that's coming out from state, from the 
sorry, from the state, from USBE, um, in terms as also Portrait of a Canyon Scholar. So UDL, it's borrowed from architecture, and really what it means is that barrier-free or accessible design, meaning that when architects are designing a building, they're making sure that everybody can access the building or the most, the highest number of people can access the building without having it take away from the experience of somebody else, right? So if we were to boil down UDL, that's what that means. So lever handles on doors instead of doorknobs, ramps, wide interior doors, that doesn't restrict my ability to access the building, but it allows for more people to be able to access the building. So when we think of how can we design our mathematics lessons in particular with that UDL mindset, I want to kind of challenge you're thinking of when we implement these things, it allows for more students to access the mathematics. I also would encourage that when you are seeing UDL truly in action in mathematical discourse, you're going to have students that in the past maybe have not been able to achieve at the level that you would expect for them in mathematics, achieving at a much higher level. So it's kind of fun. So UDL in another practical example, or one that's a little bit fun here, is in women's hockey, we're starting to see this change of the names on the jerseys being moved from the top of the jersey to the bottom of the jersey where the number is. So this is interesting because when I first saw this, it was like, oh, well, that's, that's kind of, that's new. It didn't look right to me, the first jersey that I saw like this. But then if you are also into the phenomena of women's college basketball this year, I watched the LSU um, Iowa game. And what I noticed was that there were a number of girls that had their hair down or had these ponytails. And I couldn't tell who was doing what because I couldn't see their names anymore. So unless I had the roster memorized, I didn't know that number 95 was Miller. Um, I didn't know that number 10 was Angel Reese or whoever it was, right? So thinking about UDL, moving the name doesn't restrict access for anybody else, but it widens the access for more people. So discourse itself allows for multiple means of engagement, representation, and action and expression. So the action and expression is one that I really want to touch on because it's something as teachers, it's difficult for us to provide all of these ways for students to demonstrate their, their understanding of things. But when we build in more discourse, what it does is it frees you up to be able to walk around and kind of yes, yes, no, and identify who has it and who doesn't without having to wait for a formative assessment that, you know, like a quick check or, um, you know, like the practice buddy or whatever you're currently using in your classroom. In the moment, you can offer these quick scaffolds to support students to kind of deepen their understanding and be able to demonstrate what they know. The key elements in setting the norms in a classroom for discourse include the following. So setting the norms, that's kind of number one, right? Clarifying your thinking, making and testing conjectures and asking questions. You have to have norms that are centered around these three things. Otherwise, that's where it can lead to um, you know, more tattling than anything else, if I can be very transparent. Also, you've got to give rich and engaging math tasks. If we want them talking about math, we have to give them something worth talking about. We also need to have some math tools for discourse. So things like manipulatives, games, and representations. I think one of the myth busters that I've kind of been trying to work towards when we're talking about math manipulatives is that math manipulatives are there for all students to be able to access the mathematics. And it also forces those students that give you the answers like I solved it in my head or I just new. Manipulatives allow them to be able to demonstrate their understanding in a visual way. Okay. Um, you also have to build academic vocabulary. Students have to be able to have the vocabulary to have these rich discussions. Otherwise, it's just very superficial. And then lastly, that variety of grouping structures. Um, it really is a great way to get more students thinking in more ways. It also prevents this idea of, well, this person is my partner and I know that they know more than me, so I'm just going to kind of follow along with what they say. When we're switching things up on our students, they have more opportunities to kind of practice that muscle memory of good discussions. So the teacher's role in this is being able to elicit, support, and extend. Okay, so how can we elicit students' solution methods? Next, supporting the student's conceptual understanding and then extending the student's mathematical thinking. So that extension piece is really important because if we have those things 
those routines built into our classroom. When we go into asking our students these questions, they're used to extending their thinking. It doesn't look like, well, I had to do five problems and my partner only had to do three. It looks more so like we're all working on the same problem in an extended way. Okay, so really kind of challenging. Will that rule always work is a great one. So the students' roles, so I have nine up here. These aren't, you know, the, the final say. This is just what the research has out there. So I just kind of took it and adapted it for us. So what I love about the ones that are on this screen is that a lot of these are very closely aligned to the standards for mathematical practice, which is linked on this slide as well. So model with math, right? Looking for a pattern. Those are all ones that are right in those standards for mathematical practice. And this could even be something that's in your classroom in some visual way that students can go through and go, okay, can I piggyback on your idea and add? Um, can I respectfully push back and challenge your idea on this? Um, you know, or I'm, I want to ask a good question about what you've just proposed. So having those there allows students to kind of have an anchor to do that. And it kind of goes along with that idea of norms. So here is another example of a way that we can build in that discourse in a very quick and easy way. So this is which one doesn't belong, and this is a routine for the five practices. Um, so, and you know, you can see the website right there, and that's gonna be linked in this slide deck as well. But this one, quite simply, there's different categories. So things like shapes, equations, and so forth, they're projected onto the screen, and the students have to come up with an argument over which one does not belong and why. There's no wrong answer. Um, there's no right answer either for that. The right answer is the one that students are able to explain in a succinct way, right? So I could say that this top right doesn't belong because it's the only one that's not a triangle and triangles have three sides. This one has more than three sides. This one could be it because this is shaded. The rest of them are shaded white. Um, you could talk about angles. There's all sorts of different ways that students can communicate their thinking with something like this that can be really, really fun. And again, there's no wrong answer. So this is one of those low floor, high ceiling tasks that I really love to see in our math classes. I always like to make sure that we think of what we're doing in our classes in terms of what is the advocacy behind it? How are we supporting student learning, right? Um, number one, as a teacher, when students are talking about their thinking, it clarifies their ideas and gives you information. So this is how you decide that we're going to time out in this lesson regroup and then we're going to come back together after I offered another example for, you know, as one way of doing this. Um, it also allows you to see who's getting it and who doesn't. Um, you know, it's a great way to identify what students are going to come back to me at the back table for just a couple of minutes to do a quick check in. And as a, a linguist nerd, um, this is just something to kind of remind ourselves of is that assessment is from the Latin word asidere, which means to sit beside. Um, so thinking through how can we use this opportunity to sit beside our students and learn with them around mathematics. Now, moving into this idea of close reading routine in math, a couple of things that I wanted to point out is that in our instructional guides, we have two of these on there. One of them, the math three read routine, that's the teacher facing. So that's straight out of the research. On the right hand side is one that a teacher in our school district made that can be student facing. So this could be something that you could print and have up in, you know, on your classroom wall, right? The copy center would be happy to print something like this for you. If you are in the lower grades, what I would encourage you to do is think through what are the most important sentence frames and introduce one at a time for students to be able to use because that is a lot of reading for some of our littles at this, you know, at this time. So thinking through how can we make this more accessible to our younger students. So let's talk about how we do this. So when we plan for a close read, we're gonna start with the standard. So here is the content standard that we're gonna start with first. This is five NFB six, so this is a fifth grade standard. One challenge that I wanna offer you is that when we talk about standards, instead of thinking about it from the lens of my job is to teach standards, if we could flip that into our job is to structure classrooms where students can demonstrate standards. So. I know that I can solve real world problems involving multiplication of fractions and mixed numbers. I wanna make sure that I'm giving my students the opportunity to demonstrate that they can do that, okay? So that would be one opportunity that I would offer you to just kind of switch some thinking there. 
So we start with our standard and then we need to plan for how are we gonna scaffold complex text. The problem that I'm gonna show you is a very complex problem for fifth grade students. So thinking through a couple of these, what manipulatives will you use? What grouping structures will be mo most effective? And then how will I scaffold so that that way I can throw a pool noodle when my student gets stuck versus having to call in the National Guard or Baywatch? And then what context will need to be built for students to access the text? One example that I love with this one is when we were revising the DWISBAs a couple years back, one of the teachers pointed out that one of the third grade problems had to do with students, um, you know, they were going to a theme park and the ride spans from one side to the other. If students don't have the background knowledge of what spans means, that's not something that's ever pointed out in vision as a word that needs to be explicitly taught to students, that could be a really tough problem for students to even know where to start with. So what do we need to build in for students to be able to access it? And then most importantly, does this even require a close read? If they don't need to read it multiple times to solve it, it probably isn't going to be the direction that you wanna go with that question in particular, okay? So here is an example of this. So here's a question that's gonna require some deep thought for our kiddos. So let's build some context. A family spent a week at a state park. One member of the family hiked one trail twice and another trail once. Another member hiked three longer trails once, okay? So asking students, what do you know based on this context that I just gave you? And what do you wonder, what can we solve using mathematics in this, right? This image was, I think, the third one that I found on Google when I typed in family hiking. So it wasn't something that took me a ton of time to find the perfect image. Um, so keep it simple. Here's the actual question. Okay, the Farina family spent a week at the state park. Christine hiked the Evergreen Trail twice and the Yellow River Trail once. Brian hiked each of the three longest trails once. How many more miles did Brian hike than Christine? That's a heavy lift. We're talking about names that can be very complex to some of our students. They're being asked to use this graphic source of the table on the right-hand side. Um, and really, they have to have a, a good knowledge of multiple things in this multi-step word problem in order to solve it correctly. So what I did here was I gave them big picture, hey, people went hiking. Then here's the actual problem. So the first time that they read that problem, they're doing it without a pencil. They're just trying to figure out what's going on. On the screen are some very generic sentence frames that you can use with students that can be used in all problems that you're doing the close reading and math routine with. Okay, and I'm gonna show you how we can contextualize this in a little bit, but big picture in this problem blank, I would like to add blank. The problem asks us to solve blank. I agree or I disagree because blank, okay? So verbalize, what is it that we're being asked to do? The second read, now they do have a pencil. And this time what they're going to do is they're going to identify the key vocabulary, annotate the text, and note any additional info that's going to help them understand. So things like that, pictures or graphs. Oftentimes, students will skip the graphs um, because they're really just not sure what to do with them, or they've been taught to just read the words, right? So again, these are some examples of some generic sentence frames that you can use with your students. The third read, the whole idea of this is that they have spent so much time on that cognitive load of figuring out what's going on and then figuring out what to do about it. This third part is really solving. So now we've taken a DOK two or three type question and we've boiled it down to what is it that they need to do. And then they're just solving these very generic math problems. Okay, um, the last one I really wanna point out here. So this idea, read a little and do a little. And then does my answer make sense? Asking students whether or not their answer is reasonable is huge because what will oftentimes happen with students when they're faced with a word problem like this is that they're going to go to the last thing that you taught them and assume that that's what they're supposed to do. So yesterday, my teacher talked to me about multiplying, so I'm going to go ahead and multiply evergreen and yellow, right? Or we talked about adding, so I'm going to add all four of those together. And thinking about this one where they hike the evergreen trail twice, are they going to catch on that it's the evergreen trail plus the Evergreen Trail, plus the Yellow River Trail, right? Or Evergreen Trail times two plus Yellow Trail. So really having them think through whether or not it's reasonable. So thinking about what is, how does this support our students, right? 
So we're going to do another example. This is a kindergarten example. So this one is directly from Envision, just like the other one. What you can see down here at the bottom, the green, those are all of the things that our kindergarten teachers should hypothetically be reading to our kindergartners. So when I did this with a school just a couple of weeks ago, um, just to kind of have a little bit of fun with it, I read it to them and I said, okay, all I want you to do is just give me a thumbs up when you start tuning out. And for some people, it was almost immediately, right? Alex lives on a farm done and then as they go so this is a very complex problem and it's one that our students it, it's it's a beast okay so i'm you can see it up on the screen um and i'll give you kind of some some things in the middle right so alex lives on a farm with so many cats that they are hard to count um that's something that most of our students in canyon school district don't have a lot of context for, right? Most of our students don't live on a farm or near a farm where this idea of so many cats is something that they can even access. Sometimes the cats are outside, sometimes they hide in the shed. Do our students know what a shed is? Do they know why that would be on a farm and why the cats would be in there? Alex knows that the number of cats is greater than 11. There are less than 15 cats on the farm. How can Alex find out the number of cats that could be on this farm? So I'll tell you, my my daughter, who's a Canyon student, she's in kindergarten, she brought home this worksheet and I was like, oh, Cozy, I love these questions. You know, tell me all about this. And she goes, oh, mom, here's all I know. Alex has far too many cats and who keeps cats in a shed? And I'm like, oh, okay. Didn't understand any of the math behind it. She got the right answer, but really didn't understand what she was solving for. So here's our math standard, as well as where we can find it in the instructional guide. So count forward beginning from a given number within the known sequence instead of having to begin at one. So what we can see on this one is that we know that it's greater than 10 or greater than 11 and less than 15. So being able to start counting on from 11. So ways that we could scaffold this within that three read routine, what manipulatives will you use? A couple of examples up here, unifix cubes, a number line, something like that. Um, how do I want my students grouped? How will I support students in that scaffolding piece? What context? And then how can we make it more concrete? This is not a very concrete problem for our students. Okay, and then does it require a close read? I'm going to say yes because of the complexity of this. Students are asked to do multiple things in this, including figuring out why Alex has so many darn cats. All right, so once again, I think this was probably the third picture that I used again, cats in a barn, there it is. Um, how will you build the context for our students? Driving around most of our schools here, again, don't have this level of context. This is not an image that many of them will see nearby where they live. Um, what needs to be explained that doesn't have anything to do with the math? What is the schema required for this? Okay, so here's our problem again. Um, what I did here was I added a little bit more context into these sentence frames for our students to show how we can use those very basic ones and then we can add more into it, right? So uh, retell what's happening in this problem. We're trying to figure out how many, how many cats Alex could have. We don't have to know how many he has exactly. How many could he have? All right, identify the key vocabulary. I put some in there greater than, less than, teen numbers. When we talk about annotation, again, how we're gonna contextualize this, this is for kindergarten. I want students to just highlight or underline the numbers, right? Um, what else do they need to know? They need to know that the barn is there. That's what that image was. So what numbers did the students cross out? And then I counted blank to show blank cats. So again, those are just some examples of some sentence frames that have been contextualized for this problem. So before I showed you ones that you could use with any problem, in this one, this would be very specific to this problem or problems like this. Okay, same thing here. As students were reading with a pencil, I drew blank hats to solve the problem because blank, I agree or I disagree. And then lastly, my drawing shows blank hats in the barn, blank hats outside the barn because. So our ultimate goal when we talk about close reading in math and mathematical discourse is that we want students to be able to engage in this with a partner. Ultimately, we want them doing it independently. That idea of adaptive reasoning allows for our students to apply this where it's appropriate. Okay, some of the scaffolds, again, are things like precision partners, having some type of, again, norm. So this is the four L's of productive partners. I've also seen slant. Um, what manipulatives are you going to use? Again, have students show their thinking with the manipulatives. It's not just to help them understand it. It's to, it's to help them understand how to communicate their solutions to problems. 
what sentence stems are most appropriate and then how will you sequence the problem as well. So I have on the right, this is the close reading routine that you have in Wonders. So why close read versus some of the other ones are out there? Number one is because it directly aligns to our ELA. Okay, so it's something that students are familiar with at some level. It also encourages the students to read the problem multiple times to build that context. This is a great strategy for a multilingual learners. Um, and then also some of the ones that are out there never actually require the students to read the problem, right? So they just start going in and kind of doing the math. So this is one that I would highly encourage you to consider adding to your routine, okay? The purpose of it, when you start planning for this, making sure, number one, ensure the students know what they're being asked to do. Number two, create opportunities for students to reflect on ways mathematical questions are presented to them. So on the example of the Farina family, there were multiple ways to solve that problem. Um, can they identify that? And then equip students with tools used to negotiate meaning. Do they know what's going on within the problem and can they get through it at a deep level? Because when, when we allow students to think deeply about mathematics, what that really does is it doesn't just allow where they can solve this one problem, like the Farina family or the cats in the barn, but we want them to have the opportunity to solve multiple problems. So what tools can we give them to generalize their understanding of mathematics? So looking back at our learning intentions and success criteria, just quick reflection. Do you feel like you are, you've are you learned a little bit more about close reading and math, mathematical discourse to increase student talk time um, and help your students develop some complex problem solving skills? And do you feel like you have the skills needed to try the close reading routine in your classroom? So on this page, this is some resources and links for you that I used in this presentation. So there was the would you rather at the beginning with the Cheez-Its. There was the which one doesn't belong with the four shapes. In the instructional guides, there's close reading and math and then the math language routines. And then from Los Angeles Unified School District, there's a two pager on um, the close reading and math routine. So. I hope that you enjoyed your time today and that this was 26 minutes and 55 seconds well spent. So I look forward to any feedback that you have for me and I hope that you have a great rest of your year. We're in that home stretch. Thank you for all that you do for the students of Canyons.